You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Are you ready for opening day 2024? Oh gosh, that's that's in a couple of days. I should probably think about opening day. Right. I mean, like, here's the thing. I know I'm going to be at Cork and Carry. I, you know, I know right. I, I'd be down there at the shadow of the ballpark, big party as it is every year for opening day and all of opening weekend and really any time that you go out there at 33rd and Princeton. But I haven't even gone and checked on the big banner in front of Cork and Carry for Saxon in the Basement. I haven't even done that. Like somehow the end of March got here so fast. And I'm just in absolute shock that we're here. And maybe it's because the White Sox have had no urgency to set their their roster. I might be sitting at the bar at 33rd and Princeton, having an award-winning burger, trying something at the big, beautiful bar, having a craft beer, you know, getting ready to go over there for opening day and still not be sure exactly who's on the 26-man roster. They have held those cards so close to their vest, but I believe... The reason why they've done it is, and and you and I have kind of chatted about this already, Chris Getz made his first trades, his first moves, his first decisions, and not everybody that he envisioned a month and a half ago as on this roster, or when he acquired them, envisioned them on this roster, were ready for the start of the season. Uh, Shoemake, here's a guy who gets injured, and the first time we heard that he was probably making the team was reports that, oh, he's unfortunately maybe going to start the season on the IL, and he had the inside track. And you're looking at his stance and going, Braden Shoemake has done nothing. But here he is. He got back from his injury, gets every opportunity to hit over the last week or so. His numbers are better than Mendix. Remillard's come down a little bit. He makes perfect sense now. He plays very good defense. He's got speed. Sitting about 250 or so right now in spring training in the limited time he was there. And I think he's on his way to Chicago. Oh yeah, and and you you sit there and on, on one hand it's like, well, okay, if you're not going to envision where this guy fits into your team, why trade for him in the first place? It's not like you're collecting assets that you're going to be able to sell off in a marketplace somewhere for like some myth- mythical gold coins or points or something. You're you're really just doing it because you envision Braden Shoemake as a utility infielder, right? As a guy that you sit there and go, well, I, I love his base running. I love his defense around the diamond. I, I think he can hit enough in a part-time role that we can make use of him. And if you think about a utility infielder, what do you really need him for? You want him in there so that he can step in, play some defense if need be, you know, give a guy a day off. But more to the point, with a bench player right now, you need a base stealer, right? You need somebody to come in who can sit there and say, he can play for his base, but he can also swipe a bag for Andrew Vaughn in the bottom of the eighth when you're trying to get, you know, trying to tie up a game or something like that. I just didn't think he was like a serious roster piece when that trade happened. No. Because you you dealt Aaron Bummer for five pieces because the Braves needed to get rid of guys on their 40-man because they had a roster crunch. Soroka was the prize, and Lopez was the guy that you were like, well, he could be a utility guy. It depends on what we're going to do in the offseason. He could end up being the starting second baseman. But Shoemake just seemed like, well, they had to give us five bodies. And we're like, oh, we'll, we'll throw this guy in. If he ends up... He's Charlotte depth. He's 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 a, a different version of what you've had in Zach Remillard or in Ben Zobris 2.0 or in, you know, insert insert guy here that we've seen in the past. But the thing is, imagine if he actually now as he as we expect him to makes the team, right? Like we're we're recording this a couple days before opening day. The show is out a couple days before opening day, but like this is the last show before opening day. And so I'm just going to assume he's on there. Fan graphs has him on there. Every indication out of camp is that he's there. If all of a sudden he shows up and he's making contributions, that even increases how much that trade meant for this season. Now, on the other hand, none of those players are getting you to a championship. I mean, maybe, maybe Soroka becomes like a star again, and then he signs, and then he's around when you're actually making that run. But, like, I'm not sitting there going, well, look at this. I mean, you traded Aaron Bummer, and you got all these pieces, and that's why we're going to win the World Series. Nobody's got those expectations this year. But to have just another guy who's actually going to be part of your 26 man, if he does work out, if he is able to contribute, if you and I aren't sitting here asking why is this guy on the team in mid-May, then that's impressive. Yes, 
I, I think we could be asking why is this guy on the team in mid-May. I'm, I'm going to be watching to see what he actually has. But again, you know, you got him for a left-handed reliever. So exactly. as part of a package with other players. So it, it's sort of gravy, right, for, for Shoemake to make it. Now, here's what I would like the White Sox to do on Thursday, honestly. I want to treat the 26 man as the Royal Rumble, right? We know certain people are coming in. <laughs> But every every ninety seconds, somebody else's music hits, and they come running on in, and then we'll just see who ends up still standing. Don't announce it until the op- until they announce all the players, right? Like when they all come out right. on the field, and you announce the entire roster on opening day, just like the Royal Rumble. All of a sudden, the clock ticks like the last five seconds, and outburst who Brian Paul, Shaw? The, yeah, Brian <laughs> Shaw. You know. <laughs> He made the team, right? Corey Lee, shockingly on the team because of an injury to Stassi. That's already Oh, my assured, God. Right? That's Zach Deloach's music. We didn't know Zach Deloach was going to be here. That would be a surprise if he showed up. He's not He's not making the no, team. No, he's not making the team. Uh, he's, Nestrini he's would be adopted. a surprise, too, because Nick Nestrini, I think, is, I think the plan is that he's the fifth starter. I think he's definitely in the rotation. And guess what? He may be called the fifth starter because they're holding him down for service time reasons, but the moment he shows up, he's not really the fifth starter because he he impressed. Even if he had a shaky start in his last start, he impressed. He's going to make the team. From what I've heard, I believe James Fox over at Future Sox has pointed this out. We're talking a week or two. You got to keep him down that long for an entire extra year of control. So they're going to go four-man rotation with bullpen days, I would hope. I mean, Pedro suggested the idea of taking a Garrett Crochet, who's never started a regular season Major League Baseball game and is suddenly the ace in the opening day starter. His second start would be on short rest. That seems ludicrous to me. Stretch out Tanner Banks and have a bullpen day. Well, no, so they have the the day off after they play on Thursday for opening day, then they have a day off. So you could get him through on regular rest to pitch against the Braves, and then you're going to need a bullpen day probably against the Royals in that first weekend in April. Okay, maybe that's what I was looking at. Maybe that's what I saw. And then you probably that's what you need this the 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 fifth starter going into the Red Series on April 12th, okay? So you could and and the guys that are in the bullpen, if you think about who's in the bullpen, you have Michael Kopech who is stretched out as a starter who could cover multiple innings. You have Tanner Banks who we know can cover multiple innings. Davey Garcia is the one if he makes the team that becomes interesting because he is also a guy that is stretched out for multiple innings and is and is a guy that frankly you could make the argument could have have opportunities to start down the road based on his history. So the idea that they're going to do a bullpen day somewhere in that first weekend in April just to hold the Strini back and let him get starts down in Charlotte isn't necessarily out of the question. And then it has the benefit of of manipulating the service time too. Of course, he's not going to be happy about it. The MLB Players Association will probably have something to say about it. But also, Chris Getz isn't the only GM who's going to pull that move starting off the season here for, for a team. Let's just real quick go through the names so that as we're referencing back to everybody uh, throughout this show, let's let's go through. I think Fangrass has it. I think Roster Resource, Jason Martinez has been on the show before. I think he's got it at this point. It, it continues to evolve. There's been times where I've said he's wrong on somebody but now it seems to be pretty set. All right. So this official socks in the basement, look at your opening day lineup, opening day, 26 man roster brought to you by Hyatt home medical equipment, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living, make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. Maybe you suffered an injury as well. My sister supposedly has torn her rotator cuff or injured it. She doesn't know how she did it. I think she's throwing way too many curveballs. She's walking around with a sling on her arm. She may need some medical equipment. High at home medical equipment is where she can go. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling. If you're like my sister Gina and you're falling apart, they will work with your insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. Plus, if you need a CPAP machine and you're unhappy with your vendor, switch and get supplies directly mailed to you. Plus, test it all out in their showroom. And they have the latest and greatest in continuous glucose monitors. See more about High at Home Medical Equipment at HHME.com. All right, let's take a look at this roster and uh, let's see here. Uh, we all know who the starters on this team are. All right, I don't think I need to go through all of them. Your new second baseman is Nicky Lopez. Paul DeYoung's going to be over at short. Dominic Fletcher's going to be out in right. Martin Maldonado's going to be your catcher. 
And uh, the, the rest of the regular guys, Benintendi still in left, Moncada's over at third, Robert Jr.'s over in center, Yemen is going to be your DH, Vaughn's going to be at first base. Corey Lee's going to make the team because of an injury to Stassi, which doesn't seem like a major injury. And you wonder if they're saying, do we want to give Lee a couple of weeks because Stassi's got something that's annoying him? And are we going to play him? And if you're going to have him make the team, I'm curious as to how many at-bats he'll get before the 15-day IL for Stassi runs out or until Stassi's ready again. Like, if this kid comes out and is hitting like he did in spring in the first couple of weeks, does he just hold the job? Does he become somebody that's going to get regular at-bats and not get sent down? He's an early storyline. Gavin Sheets is on your bench. He's an early storyline as well because he's coming back down to earth over the last week or so. Those those crazy video game numbers are gone. And he's come back down to earth a little bit. And if he comes out and he, against major league pitching shows that he's a spring training AAA hitter and it's going to be more of the same from last year, how short is his leash? You have Shoemake, who's going to be your super utility guy. You got Pilar, who was released and then re-signed to a major league contract which was kind of an odd move, and I, I haven't really understood the the reasoning behind it. Maybe I'm missing something there, but he's on the bench as well. Those are your position players. And then when you look at your rotation, you're going Crochet, Soroka, Fetty, Flexen, Nestrini. And when Nestrini shows up, he's going to slot in there somewhere. He doesn't necessarily have to be behind Flexen. And then the bullpen, they got Kopech and Wilson and Brebia and Leisure, and all of them are capable of closing. You have Hill, who's a lefty. You have Banks, who's a lefty. I'm so happy that Tanner Banks made this team. Please do not let him be the guy that gets sent down when you need to make room for Nostrini. Instead, that would probably be Brian Shaw. I don't think it's going to be Garcia. And then uh, James Fegan has reported he believes that Dominic Leone will be the extra relief pitcher that's going to get brought alone. You would think he or Shaw would be the guy that leaves to make room for Nick Nestrini when he gets up here. And that's your 26-man roster. And I and I think that there's some interesting storylines as to how guys are going to get used off the bench early on. And I also love how Pedro insinuated that if he doesn't have a Dennis Eckersley, and you could tell he talks to Tony. You could tell he talks to Tony that he uses Eckersley. Well, yeah, who, yeah uh, <laughs> Dennis Eckersley is such a... It, it, Eckersley, look, I'm not saying that for those who ever watched Eckersley pitcher remember what he was when he became a closer right that he's not one of the greatest to ever do it but at this point he's become a very obscure reference hey, think about that like he could have gone with Mariano Rivera who some consider well, to be the best ever right the he, best ever. he could have gone with like somebody from like the White Sox in recent history Liam Hendricks or World Series history Bobby Jenks but he Liam goes, Hendricks would have made all the sense in the world because he was literally here last year right but instead what he does is he goes well, you know, unless you got a Dennis Eckersley. So you know that that's uh, Tony philosophy and it's a good philosophy. Here's the funny thing. It's a good philosophy. If Tony oh, yeah, yeah. has been talking to him about how he should use his bullpen and this is rubbed off on the White Sox manager. There's some interesting things about this quote and, and I want to break it down because it was it was just said on Monday and and Pedro was asked about the bullpen and a closer. And did he have a closer? And here's his full quote. No, I wouldn't have one anyway, unless you bring back Dennis Eckersley. There's the Tony La Russa influence right there. Or somebody like that. We're attacking leverage. Somebody takes it on. Somebody takes it on. But even then, how can I justify to myself or sleep at night if we have a leverage situation in the eighth with the two, three, four hitters coming up and I don't use our best guy or the best leverage guy available on that day? Now, on one hand, That is correct. Yes. That is a modern way of looking at the game. That is how you use a bullpen. You don't necessarily have to have a guy named the closer. I think that's beautiful, wonderful, and I hope he practices that. On the other hand, did he just mention the top three hitters in an order and refer to them as the two, three, four guys instead of the three, four, five guys? If he really believes the two, three, four guys are the, I mean, that was his go-to thing in the middle of his quote when there was no BS, when he wasn't spinning anything and he wasn't thinking about stuff he said earlier about his lineup. He goes, if we're in a leverage situation in the eighth with the two, three, four hitters coming up and I don't use our best guy, that means naturally somewhere in his brain, he knows the best three hitters are your two, three, four. 
And yet somehow, he keeps trying to tell you Yoan Moncada is going to be the two-hitter because of the situational hitting. Now, sit there, think about that, try not to let your brain ooze out of your left ear, because if you think on it too hard, you'll go nuts. Well, my brain just oozed out of my nose thinking about that. So. <laughs> I mean, really, because that's the thing. I've said this before on this show, and I, I've said it over years on this show. They will spin something, right? Like the, the White Sox Broadcasting Network will spin something, or one of their talking heads will spin something, or they will spin something in front of the media for you. But they will forget the spin, and later on, when they're talking about something completely different, they'll expose that they were spinning. They'll expose that you weren't crazy when you doubted something that they said. Because Daryl Van Scowen put out recently, just I, I want to say it was their, their order on the 25th. So on the 25th of March, their lineup came out. And he, he put it out there. This is the likely opening day lineup. Pilar is a possible right, right fielder against a lefty pitcher. And then you would see Crochet as a starter instead of Soroka. But he put out the lineup on that day. And so this is a guy who's following the team. This is pretty much what everybody thinks is going to be the lineup. And it goes Benintendi, Mancata, Robert Jr., Jimenez, Vaughn, the young Fletcher, Maldonado, and Lopez. Those are your one through nine in in your order. That's likely the opening day order. And so you you have a manager who, when talking about the closer situation, and I love what he said about the closer situation. It's exactly right. You use... The guy who's got the liveliest arm, the hottest hand out of the bullpen, the, the, your big gun in the big moment, the guy that matches up the best when you are facing their heart of their order, trying to hold on to a lead or keep it close or whatever you're doing, whether it be in the seventh, the eighth or the ninth inning. You don't just hold a guy until the ninth who may never get used in the right situation. That's wonderful. On the other hand, he references the heart of an order as the two, three, four. It, it's... <sighs> And Mancata, that means, in his mind, is one of the three best hitters on this team and leads off the heart of your order. When yeah. we've been yelling that the two spot, you I mean, honestly, you should be starting Robert Jr. in the two spot and putting Jimenez in the three and putting and putting Vaughn in the in the in the four. Which I think would make a lot more sense. And it would make a ton of sense because you don't have a speed demon up at the top of the order in Ben Intendi. And Mancata has never shown, with the exception of just a blip. On, on, the, on the radar in 2019, the ability to be one of your premier hitters in your in your order. So he believes the two, three, four for another team are the best of the best in that quote. And he puts Yohan Moncada in the two spot. But again, I, you know, there's there's still going around Yohan Moncada. There's still this aura where people think he's good, but he's not. And, and, and we know <laughs> and, and the numbers know and objectively he's not. But. Yeah. But there's still this sort of thought that that he's there. Now, the one thing I will say about putting Moncada in the second spot there is he's extremely protected in that spot. He's he's going to get some easier stuff to hit. They're, they're not going to come after him quite as hard because you don't want to have your number two guy get walked. They're going to give him an opportunity to hit his way on or at least hit into a double play and get Benintendi off the bases too. So at least he's got some protection there. So maybe he does have a little bit of a bounce back season, not worth what his – salary figure is for next year by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I don't know that that anybody would, other than Pedro, when they're talking about the heart of the order, wouldn't say three, four, five. Okay, because that is, typically speaking, across the league, your three hitters, your best hitter, your four and your five hitter end up being some of your better run producers, right? And those are the guys that generally have the power. Those are the guys that generally are the ones that come up in the clutch. Those are generally the guys that you sit there and you look at them and go, this is the most dangerous combination of being able to put the ball in play and put it out over the fence. Your two hitter tends not to be that guy. But your two so, hitter in recent years has been one of your best hitters. Well, and I understand that that. When and when we've seen guys that have a lot of power in the two hitter spot. I mean, I, I would I would beg to differ that I don't know if the five in recent years has been as good of a hitter as the two. Well, it depends again too on 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 what team you're talking about, right? Like I'm not talking about the White Sox in particular. I'm saying that if you were to look at all all the teams across the league, I would suspect that there is still a fair chunk of them, if not the majority of them, that are not putting their best hitter in the two spot. The way the way Luis Robert Jr. should be in the two spot for the White Sox. But again, this is also this is a a lineup that as we're looking at it, you're going to have to get creative in order to try and manufacture runs out of this lineup. Really, when you look at it as as constructed with Moncada in the two spot and Vaughn down in the five spot, 
Six through nine is a really big question mark. We don't really know. Paul DeYoung had a nice spring, but it's been years since that man has hit on a regular basis during the regular season. Dominic Fletcher is a wild card at this point because I think he's going to do really, really well. I think he's going to to go back more towards what he was last year with the Diamondbacks and what he's been in the minor leagues. I think that this is just this bad spring training is just a blip and we'll see what happens with him at the start of the year. Martin Maldonado can't hit at all. He's never hit. He will never will hit because he's almost 40 years old and he still hasn't figured out how to hit. And then Nicky Lopez is Nicky Lopez and he's, he's fine for a nine hitter, you know, for those purposes, it's fine, but you don't have a lineup that up and down, you can sit there and go, you know, there's going to be nonstop pressure on a pitcher because they are going to be able to get through you know, let's say they let's say Andrew Vaughn ends the first inning, you know, and they 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 score a couple of runs. That second inning, DeYoung, Fletcher maybe is a little dangerous, but between DeYoung, Maldonado, and Lopez, I don't think a pitcher is really all that worried. Socks in the basement is part of the broadcast basement on demand radio network, which is my small business. I run a podcast network. It puts food on the table. You listening and supporting that helps me a lot. If you run a small business, you know just how challenging things can get. But you're a natural-born problem solver, aren't you? So it's all good. Still, it doesn't hurt to have some good neighborly help. Like yourself, State Farm agents are also small business owners. This enables them to help you choose the right insurance coverage to fit your small business needs. So why not insure your small business with a few small business owners who also happen to be a good neighbor? Give my friend, State Farm agent John Harrell, a call. 708-481-4500. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By the way, I'm going to dispute you a little bit on this two and five thing. I can't let it go. Uh, The Los Angeles Dodgers, I just used them as an example. Uh, Their most common lineup in the postseason was Mookie Betts leading off and Freddie Freeman hitting second. Okay. Their Their five guy most commonly was Chris Taylor. And I, I, I don't think we need to look up who's better between Freddie Freeman and Chris Taylor. No, Freddie Freeman is much better than okay. Chris I mean, Taylor. I'm, I'm, I, I, I get it. It's the old school way of looking at it, but I'm telling you with Ben Benintendi up at the top, and he's not a speed demon, make, make opposing pitchers have to deal with Robert and Jimenez right away before they've gotten settled. You know, don't let, it, don't let Moncada go up there and just be an out. And then Robert's coming up with two outs, most of the time and sometimes one out. I, I honestly think that, you know, you could you could make a case you should leave Ben and Tendy off of the off of the leadoff spot and just go with your three best guys, unless you think Ben and one of them. Well no, but here's the thing. What if Ben and Tendy wasn't the leadoff hitter? I mean what the heck? It's just it's just the first at bat of the game. After that, it's just the right. guy who's in the in the order, right? So let's get baseball philosophical here, right? It, let's take your thought of they're protecting Mancada because he's going to get an awful lot of looks with Robert and Jimenez behind him. And let's just put him in the one spot. I don't care. You want put him in the one spot. He's got a little, he's got some legs. I mean, they get tired a lot, but I mean, he's got, le- he's got some legs. He's got like, they might fall off. He's got some le- right. Exactly. He switch hits, you know, I mean, for the, for the lead off thing, you get him up there. He does his thing. If he goes away, he, go, he, he might get some looks right from the pitcher who doesn't want to see who comes out there with his warmups and you already have Robert and Jimenez swinging that big bat with the weight on it. Look at him licking their chops to start the game. So this guy's going to be like, well, I, I'm going to give him something to hit. I'm not going to give them a lot of looks at me. And also, and also, I, I got to find the strike zone. Right. He may, he may, because he's, here's the one thing Mankata's has had over the years. There's been times where it's gone away and it's come back. But remember that rookie season and I, you, when he's on, he's got an incredible eye. That's true. If you really want to do that, what, just bounce Ben Benintendi out of the one spot. See, that, that's the thing. I feel like, I feel like baseball teams need to have a guy that just comes in every once in a while and just get, you know, I mean, it doesn't need to be me, right? You don't need to listen to the guys at the podcast or the radio no, people or the newspaper. Just, no, no, no. You know, we don't need to have like a fan vote or something like that, but it's almost, I don't want to use the word consultant, but it's almost like they need a guy who does that. They need a guy who just comes in. He's like, oh, he goes around the different teams every once in a while. And the guy walks in and he goes, well, I've been watching you for a couple of weeks. And here's what I would do. Uh, you're really hung up on Andrew Benintendi being a leadoff hitter. Well, you know, he's the only guy with experience doing it since we lost Tim Anderson. 
Yeah, but you know, you don't have experience doing it until the first time you do it. So really, everybody's just a few games away from having experience doing it. And you seem to want to protect this Moncada guy you're given $25 million a year to. And and you're, you're hoping that he has a really great first half so you can dump him. You know that's what you're trying to do. Oh, 100%. <laughs> hoping he has a great first half. That's why you're pigeonholing him in there. Even though your own manager believes the best hitters are in the 2, 3, 4 spots of any team that he has to face when he's trying to figure out what he's going to do with his closer. So why not just put that guy in the one spot? Get your two big guys up there with as many at-bats as possible because this team isn't going to score a lot of runs. I don't know if you guys notice it. Like, this team's not going to score a lot of runs. Oh, no, no, we got Nicky Lopez. Yeah, that's great. Like, this team's not scoring a lot of runs. So as your consultants, I would just get those guys as many at-bats as humanly possible, especially in the first inning when they could catch a starter off, uh, off, off guard. And to be honest with you, who cares who your, or who your one hitter is? It's not really going to make that big of a difference. It's only the first at bat of the game. After that, he slots between the nine guy and the two guy. He's just another guy in the rotation as the line moves along. There's no guarantee he'll ever lead off another inning in the game. In fact, you're giving him a ridiculous amount of at bats. So if your intention is to protect Moncada with your best hitters so you can maximize him in the hopes you can move him or finally get out of him what you always wanted from him because you're stubbornly attached to what he could be, even though he's never been it, then why not just lead him off and put the, the two big guys at the 2-3 spot and move Vaughn up? And then you could put Ben Benintendi behind Vaughn. Heck, heck, you could put Ben Benintendi between Vaughn and Jimenez. You absolutely could. I, I, right? Yeah. I mean, like think, like, think about that. Why are we futzing around with, so, with, with this old school way of thinking when you're going out there with a team that needs to do something different to compete because they're definitely not going to do it based off of their OPS. They're not going to do it off of their weighted runs created. They're not going to do it with their offense. They're not, they're not going to go out there and do it in the traditional way. That's why they are picked to have basically zero chance of making the postseason by every model that's out there going into the season. There's a reason for that. So if you take these parts where if used in a traditional manner will give you nothing, then why wouldn't you try a non-traditional approach to see if you catch lightning in a bottle? Or do you just feel like wasting the next six months? Like that would be me as a consultant talking to them. I would say, look, I love what you're doing. I love the defense. I love the pitching. I think the idea of inducing ground balls, Eric Fetty may not be as lights out here because this is America, but you know what? He's still going to get some ground balls. Like I, I, I see a lot of things you're doing. You're going to bring up some young stars. You're not really competing this year, but why not do it this way? Because it may net you a few extra wins. It may find you a little bit more out of Moncada. You might be able to move him. It may give you some more excitement. You may learn more about your players. Because the traditional way will net you nothing. You already know that. Every computer model and every person doing a prediction, whether it be gambling or whatever, they all say, if you just do this traditionally with these guys, it ain't going to work. So why not? That would, I guess that would be my take if I were brought in. Nobody wants to hear from me, but that's what my take Yeah, would be. I was about to say nobody's paying attention right. to us, but that's that's okay. But here's the thing, too. Like, you know, you, you can look at some certain statistics, and, and I know – when Andrew Benintendi let off last year, he started to have a better year, right? He he hit 301. He was doing, you know, doing a nice job as the leadoff hitter. Uh, he's also got a really low strikeout rate, right? He's a guy that when you're talking about causing pitchers to be pains, putting him behind Andrew Vaughn helps Andrew Vaughn to a certain degree, even though he might not be a run producer, even though he's not a home run hitter, okay? But having him back there and, and a guy that's going to put the ball in play with guys on base, especially in the first inning, all that stuff, that, that's that's a an important thing. Interestingly, when you look at Yohan Mankata, when he's the first, not not the leadoff hitter, but when he's the first batter of an inning, okay, when he's leading off an inning, last year in 61 games, he had 89 plate appearances leading off of an inning, and he hit 317. And he had an on-base percentage of 371, which is pretty good. He had an OPS of 895 leading off an inning. He actually does pretty well as the first batter of an inning. So... Why not give him a chance to start off a game and see if maybe that does help, you know, get him going? Because if they, if he's going to respond well to starting off an inning, if he's going to respond well to a pitcher coming out and trying to find the strike zone, trying to buy a couple of strikes, get into his rhythm, because that's what happens at the start of an inning, even if they're coming out for their second, third, fourth inning, whatever it is, it's still, you can look at these things and you can make a case for anything. The most important thing is you have two guys in the lineup right now that we know are going to be able to do some damage, and that's Luis Robert Jr. and Aloy Jimenez. 
And even Jimenez, we didn't really know until we started seeing that he seems healthy this spring. So all you have now is a lot of question marks, two guys. So get those two guys into the game and in as many at-bats as possible. And yeah, don't worry about being traditional because nothing about this team is traditional. Heck, you've paid a starting catcher who isn't going to hit over 200 this year, guaranteed. Taking Luis Robert Jr. out of the equation, and I'll even take Jimenez out of the equation too, because I think he's going to be—I think he's going to be good it, it, when he's healthy. I think he's definitely the second best hitter on this team. A hundred percent, yeah. Who ends up being the best hitter besides those two guys, or the most exciting person to watch, or the best offensive player, or the guy who's contributing to the most runs? Like who—who's the guy that you're going to be like? That's—that's that's your third best offensive output on the team. I think Andrew Vaughn takes that step. I hope so. I, I have more faith in him than I have in Moncada, right? And, and and here's the thing. Ben Intendi could very easily have a very nice year. He's not done. He could he could turn around with a with a new attitude and a different group of guys around him and a second year in Chicago and have one of his better years, which on a baseball card is actually pretty good. So you may actually get his worth this year. But yeah, I'm rooting for Andrew Vaughn. I, I think Andrew Vaughn, I think Andrew Vaughn, from a pure ceiling standpoint, I think Andrew Vaughn could get to Aloy Jimenez, maybe not with as many home runs. He can he can get up there though, with average power, a high OPS, and and doing the things offensively that we were told this whole time he's capable of doing. I think Fletcher's a dark horse, but I think Fletcher it's it's still basically going to be a rookie year for him. He's going to be too up and down this Who, year. Who's the best starting pitcher in this rotation? Soroka. Yes, I agree. I think that's going to be your best starting pitcher in the rotation. I don't, I don't think there's going to be much question about yeah, that. We're going to be halfway through the year worried about whether or not we can keep him around. I think he's I think he's ready to go, and I think we're going to see a rebirth of a guy who is dealing with all kinds of injuries, and, and he's going to have a magical season. It's going to be the pitching equivalent of what we saw with the Jake Berger breakout, but it's going to be better than that because he's a really high-level pitcher when he's on. Who is, final question, the guy in the end that when the chips are down – and Pedro needs to go face that 2-3-4 in the big situation. Who's his best guy out of the bullpen? How will that shake out? Steve Wilson. Ah, uh, Jordan Leisure, man. I'm with the young guy. I think by the end, it's, by the time it's all over, it'll be Jordan Leisure. You think Steve Wilson? I think I think Wilson's going to be the guy that Pedro goes to. I think Leisure's going to be the guy that you want to see come in because he's the guy that's more likely to get the electric strikeout. I think Wilson, though, is going to be Pedro's security blanket. Secretly off to the side, Tanner Banks will be like the best one statistically and nobody oh, will mention and, yeah, it. And, and, <laughs> and we'll all forget about Tanner Banks, but Tanner Banks is just going to get the job done the whole year. Socks <laughs> in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.